everyone to the CAG Access webinar featuring Dr. Joseph Renzulli and Dr. Sally Reese. My name is Dr. Julia Nyberg, and I serve as the Executive Director for the California Association for the Gifted. We can't thank you enough for being here this evening. We would also like to especially give our thanks and gratitude to Renzulli Learning for supporting the event this evening. If you're just joining us, please enter your role that you have an education so our speakers get a sense for the audience. Also, you're welcome to participate in the chat box during the presentation. However, our speakers won't be able to answer your questions in the chat box during the presentation. Instead, we ask that you ask your questions at the Q&A pod, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Your question won't be visible to the whole audience. However, it will be visible to our speakers and they will answer these questions at the end of their presentation this evening. This session will be recorded and please be patient with us as we launch into YouTube. It takes us a while to prepare these recordings for the YouTube environment. I would like to introduce our speakers this evening. First, I would like to start with Dr. Joseph Renzulli. Dr. Joseph Renzulli is a distinguished professor of educational psychology at the University of Connecticut and an international leader in gifted education and talent development opportunities for all students. His school-wide enrichment model, which focuses on total school improvement is widely used throughout the world. He has obtained more than $50 million in research grants and the American Psychological Association named him among the 25 most influential psychologists in the world. In 2009, he received the Harold W. McGraw Jr. Award for Innovation in Education. And he was recently listed as one of the world's top 30 international education professionals by the Global Guru Annual Survey. He lists Compertude, a summer program that began in 1978 and has served more than 30,000 teachers from around the world as his most important practical contribution to talent development in young people. Let's give a virtual round of applause for Dr. Renzulli. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Sally Reese. Dr. Sally Reese recently completed a six term, excuse me, a six year term as the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and is currently holding the Latita Neek Endowed Chair and is a Board of Trustees Distinguished Professor at the Neek School of Education at the University of Connecticut. She was previously a department head of educational psychology, where she also served as the principal investigator for the National Research Center on the Gifted and Talented. Sally has authored or co-authored over 250 articles, books, book chapters, monographs, and technical reports. She is an expert in enrichment, talent development, curriculum differentiation, underachievement, talented readers, and gifted girls and women. She serves on several editorial boards and is a past president of the National Association for Gifted Children. She has been named a Distinguished Scholar of the National Association for Gifted Children and a Fellow of the American Psychological Association. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Sally Reese and Dr. Joseph Renzulli. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we're happy to be able to participate in this in spite of the terrible ep epidemic that's going on around the, <clears throat> the country. Uh, I uh, would like to begin uh, with just a couple of comments. Uh, Julia mentioned uh, Renzulli Learning is a sponsor of this. Uh, Sally and I developed that with lots and lots of uh, 
venture capital a number of years ago at the University of Connecticut, and the university eventually sold it. So it's a private corporation, and uh, although it's independent of us, we firmly believe in it because you can't do the kind of teaching that we're going to talk about tonight without easy access to number one, comprehensive profiles for children, and number two, a vast category, 50,000 some resources. So again, we thank Renzulli Learning for sponsoring this, although we feel it's almost a part of our DNA. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, begin by uh, pointing out that um, we've been working on this for 40 plus years, a lot of research and a lot of practical implementation. We've learned more from the teachers that have used our model to enlarge and improve and change the model than actually existed at the very beginning. So we're greatly indebted to them. And also we stand on the shoulders of lots of giants in the field. Uh, many Californians, uh, for example, uh, Sandy Kaplan and uh, people that have contributed in other areas uh, and Jim Gallagher and Paul Torrance and Julian Stanley, the list goes on and on. Ask me some time to give my historical lecture because I love those people. Um, however, uh, you see the two quotations on the bottom of the screen there. Ideas and theory without practice are mere intellectual play. We believe that all of the theories aren't worth a dime unless they can be translated into practice that teachers understand. And so we, we pride ourselves on always working toward uh, practicality. And the second quotation there it, uh, says uh, about the same thing. So anyway, there you see a beautiful picture of our campus and we'll move on to uh, the first slide. What I'm gonna try to cover in this set of slides is the basic difference between two types of pedagogy. And, one of those is pedagogy for acceleration or enrichment, or what we typically use in the regular curriculum. And the second, which you see on the left, and the second is the uh, enrichment learning and teaching pedagogy that's been the focus of our work, and ELT we call it for short. And I wanna emphasize at the start <clears throat> that these two things are complementary; they're not competitive. People always say that the gifted, the enrichment people are against the acceleration people and vice versa. We believe that both are important and both have great value. And you see there uh, our area of concentration. Uh, and whereas there's a prescribed or canned curriculum in most cases on the left, our curriculum is one that you'll see in the next slide or two that we try to build around the child. So. That's why I put the word uh, curriculum in quote. And we emphasize that in this kind of a curriculum, only necessary information to address a particular problem that a young person or a group is working on becomes the, the knowledge, the information, the background, the know-how. Uh, and uh, the other things there, you see some differences in time in our work, uh, especially when it comes to our most advanced type of enrichment, type three, is determined by the nature of the problem. I've started on things that I thought I'd get done in two weeks, and I'm working on them two years later. And by the, I put destination in quotes, because uh, that does help set time limits. If you're entering in a state science competition, for example, or you're getting something ready with a publication de deadline, then that also enters into it. So there are more real world endpoints in what we're talking about. I think that the last item is the, almost the way I like to describe our words, work, the student thinking, feeling, and doing like the practicing professional, even if at a more junior level than a person from Caltech or MIT or a filmmaker from Hollywood. They're doing what the big guys and gals do, even at a, at a more junior level. Um, I wanna begin by talking about something that's very important if you're gonna use this kind of work. And that's two different kinds of, of assessment. This is information, let's say, underlying ELT pedagogy. And the first type is what most educators are familiar with, assessment of learning, 
we find out what a kid already knows, and that's supposed to help us do something with that information. Uh, the type that uh, I am focusing on right now, in fact, in a current research project, is what I call assessment for learning. What skills students need to develop to learn to enjoy, be creative and enthusiastic about their learning. And over the years, we've developed a number of instruments uh, 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 to, to gather this information. Instruments, by the way, completed by students. And the three in yellow are the ones that are already built into Renzulli Learning. They were originally paper and pencil instruments. I have interest elizers that are from diapers to doctorate. I give them to incoming doctoral students to find out what they want to learn about when they're here at UConn. And the other ones are instruments that are currently undergoing uh, research and development. Everything we do is research, and those will eventually be invented into student profiles. So Sally is going to show you some wonderful examples as we move along. Um, and one of the things, this little slide is to point out that when they were paper and pencil version, there were almost endless piles of paperwork for teachers. And so one of the things, the reason we developed Renzulli Learning is all that information, interest, learning styles, etc., is now found out by a young person sitting down at their computer. And we built that into the Renzulli Learning System. So go on. This next slide is something that you already know. Oops, I'm sorry. Am I going in the wrong direction here? Okay, this is something you already know but haven't thought about lately. All learning, and when I say all learning, I mean from diapers to doctorate, exists on a continuum. And that continuum ranges from deductive, didactic, prescriptive on the left-hand side. Remember, I said both sides are important. All to the right-hand side, which is inductive, investigative, and inquiry-oriented. And there you see the outcomes of those things, the major theorists. Um, I always like to point out that the behaviorists, Pavlov, Pavlov, Thorndike, and Skinner work with rice, mat, <laughs> uh, right, mice, rats, chickens, and pigeons to learn to develop a learning theory. Well, the human brain is a little bit more complex than those. Now, the focus of our work is on the right-hand side, and we have a very simple goal for our work. And that's to produce, when people ask me, why gifted programs, why talent development programs? It's to increase the world's supply of creative and productive people, the, what I call the gold standard. So there you see uh, the, uh, really what is the major goal of what we're trying to do. Um, and again, I wanna emphasize that we're not arguing against a regular curriculum accelerated curriculum, but we do want some balance between just test prep types of education and what we call CP or creative productive giftedness. You'll see many examples of that tonight, today, whatever time of day it is in your time zone. Also, I want to talk briefly about two different types of curriculum. There's a, the curriculum is what we teach, and I divided them into Curriculum one, standards, textbook, test-driven, prescribed. And the second curriculum that I've already mentioned earlier, that we build the, the curriculum around the students. Pedagogy is how we teach it. And this is a list of major types of different strategies that uh, teachers use uh, in various ways. And I want to also point out that they don't use any single one of them. Oftentimes, they're used in combination with one another. So those are the kinds of things that are the focus of the pedagogy in ELT uh, theory. Now, how does this work? Glad you asked that question. We start at the middle. You see a student or a small group of students that share a common interest or problem, and, and we'll work on it <clears throat> through some kind of a group project. And the first thing is what we call problem finding and focusing. I'm interested in whales, fine. Now, which aspect of whales, migration, uh, uh, fertilization, whatever uh, kinds of things, uh, food chain. Uh, also, you see two other things that we do there. Begin the development of a management plan, which is 
follows a professional approach to investigative skills and an interview with a facilitating teacher, a mentor, a community person that might have special expertise in that area. The next thing is, and I'm gonna to have to move this a little closer, human and material resources, and then also a focus on methodological resources. And my next love in the world after my lovely wife and family is what I call how-to books. You'll see some examples of that. We believe that every gifted program should have lots of access to the kinds of books that teach children how to be a filmmaker or how to be a puppeteer or an architect or a designer, a fashion designer. Uh, the third circle is the role of the teacher. Again, feedback, encouragement, a shoulder to cry on, uh, teaching children that they needed to revise and rewrite. Uh, a student brought a paper into me one time and I said, that's very good for a first draft. And they said, first draft, <laughs> you know, because nothing in this world made by human beings ordinarily exists in its best form, first draft. And then finally, in some ways, I think what almost unlocks the secret and motivation for young people to work at this level, and that's finding appropriate outlets and students for their work. Uh, audiences are very important. Sally and I wouldn't be here tonight if there was no one on some tele uh, uh, computer screens around the world. And if young people are getting ready for a football game on Saturday or marching with the band at halftime, they're gonna do all those kinds of things that perfect their work so that when they get to the stage, so to speak, it's as an excellent form as possible. Uh, and again, a uh, management plan is something that you can find in our work. If you're interested in anything that we've ever written, it's on our website, www.gifted.ucon, that's U-C-O-N-N, -N, as University of Connecticut, .edu, and there's a folder there on the school-wide enrichment model. Now, the pedagogical core of our work has been something called the enrichment triad model. It involves three different types of enrichment and one other process that's not on the screen that Sally will be talking about called curriculum compacting, which is our brand of acceleration on an individual basis. And this work is a little different from a lot of other models in that you, we pr try to provide general enrichment for all students, type one and type two. And Sally will be explaining what those things mean as we move along. And then students notice, I don't say gifted for the bottom, but rather candidates for follow-up. I prefer to use the word gifted as an adjective, a gifted program, a gift that is something that's given. So anybody that turns on to one of those things, then in type one or two, or notice the regular curriculum, or the environment in general, watching television with their mother, and one child got inspired to do an award-winning science project. And another component of our model it's called enrichment clusters. It's actually become the growth stock of the model for startup programs. And you're gonna see an example of how the model works with in the next few slides. So that's basically the way our model differs from it's for gifted or not gifted. We're trying to make school a more enriching and enjoyable place for all kids because that's when lots of hidden talents will emerge. Uh, with type one, we like to refer to as the hook. That might be a visiting speaker, watching a TV show, uh, going on a field trip, and all of a sudden we do a, a follow-up, a debriefing. We then see who wants to do go further into type two or directly into a type three. And notice also the backwards arrows. Some of your best type ones can be type threes done by other children. Yeah, a famous scientist can come and show his or her work, but if another kid about their age shows their work, then that is, is oftentimes inspiring. So type one's the hook, type two's the ladder, and we have a type two taxonomy of basically thinking skills and executive function skills, and learning how to learn skills that are built into uh, our type two training. And type three, again, is the young person thinking, feeling, and doing like the practicing professional. So here we see a little picture of a child doing a project. 
Um, now, I'm a quotaholic, and the only quote on my door at the University of Connecticut, because the painters made me take all the other quotes down, is this one. Example is the best school of mankind, and they will learn it no other. And so um, I'm going to start with an example. And this is a regular classroom example. And I'm not going to read all of that, but just tell you the story. Kylie Copenhagen was in uh, her, I believe, fifth grade classroom, I'm not sure. And she fell in love with a lesson that the teacher was teaching on insects. And she really became very fond of ladybugs. And so again, with some support from her teacher, she was given an opportunity. So let me bring up one more circle here. She was given an opportunity to start work on this project and also uh, to gain some assistance from the uh, enrichment resource teacher in the school. Now here comes the things that were most useful to Kylie, even things there about starting your own business, but uh, how to design board games, uh, rules of play and table games, how to make and, and, and play them. And so with that information, she developed a, a game. Oh, here's the one, how to start and run your own business that we got her. She developed a game called the Ladybug Game. Here you see the cover of the box. Here you see a picture of the game. But let's hear from Kylie herself. We're four little ladybugs lost in the yard. Getting back home will be so hard. Side pass and I just don't be slow. Pick another card and away we go. Ladybugs, now it's your turn. Be on your guard. Give it to the ants for the winning card. Ladybugs, back in the rose bush. We're home. The Ladybug Game from Submondo, available wherever games are sold. She's almost made enough money to pay for college, graduate school, and medical school. Uh, okay, here's a regular classroom one. And again, I'm not going to read all of that, but I like this story. It's a, about a, a little boy named Ethan. And Ethan might be considered a good, solid, average student. Uh, and uh, he was enrolled in an enrichment cluster called, Do You Want to Be an Inventor? And uh, before I finish telling the story, let me point out that uh, you're going to see a short video, uh, and I'm talking now directly to principals. The principal I talked with never thought about some publicity on this, and so she called the Hartford Current, which is the leading newspaper in Connecticut, and they came out and did a story. Well, someone from one of the news channels, TV news channels, read the story and came out to the school and saw... Uh, okay, Oops, go back one. How do I start this? There you go. Good talk. Hi, my name is Ethan. I'm in second grade at Southeast Elementary School in Mansfield, Connecticut. And this is an invention that I made. It's called the Flashy Dog Bowl. And the problem my invention solves is we don't always know when my dog needs more water. So this is an easier way to tell. It's by a weight sensor electrically attached to a light bulb. And when water is inside the bowl um, and it's full, the light bulb is off. And when there's no water inside and it's empty, the light bulb is on, so it will tell you. And I think this is a really good um, project, um, invention because people are so busy, they'll get their attention because the light stands out and you can see it from another room. After your house is dark, it, the light will shine when the bowl's empty, so you're instantly know your dog needs more water. And the change I made along the way is even though it's called the flashing dog bowl, it, it doesn't flash because I was afraid that if I made it flash, then it would scare your pet and then your pet wouldn't want to drink out of it. And and more than half of the people in the United States are pet owners, so it's a, so it's a really good invention for pets. And this is my first prototype. We have cardboard and the bowl and the light bowl. And, there, and over time, um, 
because of Carl, time, I'm going to get stop wet and it right there. And, and just, um, I want to say a couple of things about Ethan. First of all, again, he was not identified as gifted, and there's a law in our state that, that says you have to be. But he had access to our enrichment specialist who helped him tremendously on that. He won his division of the state Connecticut, remember I said destination? The destination was the Connecticut State Invention Convention, something Sally and I started how many years ago? Long time. Long, long time ago. It's now going national. He then went to the finals at, at the Henry Ford uh, 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 Museum in, in, in Michigan. And um, I just got something in the mail just a week ago uh, about this year's invention that he's working on. So I don't care if he's got a G stamped on his forehead or gifted or not, but we believe in what we call the concept of or opportunities, resources, and encouragement. And that's what makes, he might be a famous engineer someday, and he may not, but the point is that we help them along on that path. A couple of other things that uh, are important ingredients of ELT, what I call just-in-time information. He didn't read poetry books to get ready for this. He read books on engineering, on making things and things like that. So this curriculum too is really a JIT or just-in-time curriculum information that you only go and get, get when you need it. Uh, important ingredients again, ELT, and there's a how-to book for absolutely everything. There's even a how-to book for how to write how-to books. And one how-to book, which I don't recommend, uh, is for adults. And so therefore, uh, we will skip that one. Um, important roles of teachers in uh, ELT pedagogy. Um, we have two different major roles for teachers. One is the very proverbial sage on the stage. But the other one is what we call the guide on the side. And that's that list of different teaching strategies that you saw earlier, where the teacher is letting kids do more of the work and they're the guide on the side that provides the assistance, the resources, and uh, the kinds of things that they might need to improve their work. Now, I think I'm almost up to my last slide. I know what you're thinking. Give me a break. How can we accommodate all of these things I got 26 students and where can I find the time? Well, we took a hint from places like Google and Microsoft and Amicon. Do you know that every week I get a personal letter from Amazon? Dear Joseph Renzulli, or hello Joseph Renzulli, it says there. And they send me certain books that they think I will buy. Now, how do they know that? Very simple. We have their, pro they have my profile. They know what I bought. Go buy something, go buy a desk lamp tomorrow on, online and for the next month, you're gonna get desk lamp advertisements because they've got your profile now. They know what you like and they know what you buy. And so this is again, the reason that we develop Renzulli Learning. And Sally's gonna talk about this uh, as we move along by giving you some examples. So I'm gonna turn this over to Sally and enjoyed very much, and I'll be around for questions and answers. Thank you, and uh, it's wonderful to be with you. And we send our best wishes for your health, and and uh, and and really, I think in a lot of ways, your patience and forbearance as we deal with this difficult time period. Um, the work that Joe and I've been doing over these many many years, I think, is best illustrated by this photograph. We want to um, cause learning to be more engaging, more enjoyable. And when we talk about strength-based learning and we talk about um, the idea of, of enrichment-based and strength-based teaching strategies, I think it's really important to note that that's what the gifted education field has been so successful at doing. We have the best pedagogy of any educational group or any educational movement in the world. And I think we need to more and more talk about why we should be using it and how we should be using it. So, so much of our work has been built on talent development and developing gifts and talents. This is Joe's 
um, three ring conception of giftedness, where we he talks about giftedness being brought being actually uh, a cluster three clusters of abilities: above average ability, task commitment, and creativity. And we believe that talent development comes from planned, purposeful, and integrative processes to that are designed to attract and develop and motivate and engage students. The goal of talent development, as Joe said, is developing creative, high-performing, happy, and engaged students who know their interests and develop and want to develop their talents to make the world a better place. And so that's the background of the school-wide enrichment model. This looks like it's a, a, a lot of information, but it's a very simple diagram. And really, if we think about what Joe introduced and what I'll be talking about, our strength-based and enrichment teaching strategies, pedagogy strategies, are right down the first column. So we're looking at looking at students' strengths, modifying curriculum, providing enrichment learning and teaching for more students, and then also bringing some of this enrichment to bear upon the regular curriculum, that what parents are doing at home now, and as Joe mentioned, a series of opportunities called enrichment clusters. In other words, our view of enrichment is as follows. We believe that enrichment should be enjoyable, engaging, and create enthusiasm for learning. The students that you heard about and the students that we followed for many, many years are enthusiastic about what they do. Some of this is built into Renzulli Learning, and I wanna mention that we're extremely proud that it is now free and free and available to use until the, the August, so if you Log on tonight, you can get a free, you can get Renzulli Learning free for your students, for your school. And again, we're pleased about that because we think it makes this brand of pedagogy so much easier. So essentially, instead of doing paper and pencils to learn about strengths, students sit down at a computer, they answer a series of research-based questions, and we identify their top three areas of interest, their top three preferred ways they like to learn, and their top three product styles. I, I just took a profiler and I drew these circles so you can see this is um, Jackie, and Jackie's top area of interest is technology. Jackie's top way he likes to, she likes to learn is technology, and her top product practice technology. So you have no doubts about Jackie when you think a little bit about what she wants to do and how she wants to do it. It doesn't always line up this way, but this is what a profile does, and this can be done in about 20 minutes. You can also choose the language, by the way, when you're doing the profile. So if you have many of your students who are, um, speak Spanish as their first language, the questions in the profile and the profiler can be done in Spanish. The second major pedagogy service in the school-wide enrichment model is modifying curriculum, compacting curriculum. I'll talk a little bit more, we've talked just briefly about it, but this is a really important strategy and there's three steps to it. The first is name your ch the child's strength area. If you're dealing with someone who's in a very advanced reader or, or someone who's very advanced in math, you want to be able to identify where the strengths are you want to document how you know that your student is strong in those areas and you want to change it but you don't want to change it by just giving more work you want to change it whenever possible by providing opportunities for enrichment in areas of interest and that's a huge core of what joe and i have talked about for the last 40 years and that's interest this is of course the major core of the school-wide enrichment model and also the major core of the teaching strategies, the strength-based strategies, and also the interest-based strategies that you know are the basis for our webinar tonight, our conversation with you tonight. Um, there are probably 150 studies that have been done on the school-wide enrichment model. You can access a summary of the research on SEM uh, for free on our website, and I will show you the links for those resources a couple times in just a few minutes. But just keep in mind, so many of them are critical. This to me is probably one of the most important that students, when bright students, identified gifted students were underachieving, when they were given the opportunity to complete a type three study to use enrichment in school on a topic of their interest, 82% 
of these young people reverse their underachievement. And that is, this is one of the biggest problems that we face with bright kids. And we believe this is probably one of the most important studies that's been done on our model and on our work. So again, in this, there's, there's three different types of enrichment. There's exposure, there's training, and there's opportunities for small group and small group projects. And what we want to do for children during this time, as Joe said, is provide them with an opportunity to experience what it's like to do creative and productive work and to feel good about it. So you saw the ladybug game. Let me introduce one other student. And this is a young boy named Michael. And Michael participated in an enrichment cluster on starting his own business, being a social entrepreneur. And essentially what Michael decided is that he wanted to develop a business so that he could buy uh, hats and gloves for high poverty children in his area, many of them immigrants. Michael lived in the very cold Northeast and wanted to buy, you know, again, mittens, gloves, scarves for children. He got a loan from his principal um, after he decided what his business would be. His district was using Renzulli Learning. He was able to identify um, how-to books that he needed. He was able to access many, many websites to start his business. And what Michael actually developed was a business that was um, based on making buttons. So he figured out his business. He had partners. I should mention Michael was in second grade when he started this project third grade when it when it you know when it finished um, but here he is uh, we were able to meet him Joe and Del Sigley met him at a at an enrichment cluster fair and here he is showing Joe with great pride his buttons and I think this is the this is what strength-based pedagogy is all about and this is what is so important in a talent focused approach we want enrichment and educational experiences to align with students' strengths, interests, and talents. We can use those strengths to, to teach students skills. We can use those strengths to increase engagement and enable personal expressions and, and really think about developing the next generation, as Joe said, of inventors and produ producers and creators. And by the way, since so many of you are home today, I think you can also realize that you can do some of this at home. Um, this is our youngest daughter. Joe and I are blessed to have two daughters. This is our youngest daughter. Uh, and this is her first enrichment cluster. I happened to be facilitating a cluster in the school and got to take this shot of her. This is the day she fell in love with theater. She made her first puppet. Um, and I, I just want to indicate that it was both a school and a home partnership that developed her interest and, and helped her become um, what she is today. So just a, a personal story. Uh, she was in elementary school. She took dance lessons, which we of course paid for. She wrote plays every year. Here she wrote a play about unsinkable Molly Brown. This is my grandmother's, some of my grandmother's clothing that she used as a costume. That's her headshot actually from high school. She starred in every high school play. In middle school, her teachers compacted her curriculum. She headed off to Northwestern University to be a theater major. Here's her headshot from Northwestern. And where is she today? She's 32. She is a, and this is from her website. Her name is Liza Renzulli. She's a filmmaker, comedian, writer, editor, um, podcaster. Her podcast is 51 First Dates. She's just finished doing an editing job for Comedy Central. The point is, she loves what she does, and she was blessed by having a school district that promoted her talents as well as parents that promoted her talents. And that's what enrichment teaching and learning is all about. Again, it's about exposure. It's about exposing children to different kinds of opportunities. We certainly took her to plays. We certainly helped in the school. We certainly made sure that she had the book she needed but we also supported her type threes. At one point, she turned her, our dining room table into a puppet theater. And this is what it takes to be able to develop the kinds of pedagogy and, and student strengths that, that results in having creative young people who grow up to do creative things. So just in summary of this section, think a little bit about type ones, now especially assigning students virtual field trips, assigning them 
opportunities for online uh, activities, DVDs and, and movies that they can read online, clips, contests and competition. All of the resources on Renzulli Learning, and there are 50,000 that are selected and vetted, particularly for students, um, are, are free. And again, this is a great time to experiment with this. Um, when you are back in school, when we are all back and in, in, uh, being, being able to expose students to speakers and bringing people into the school, I love this slide. This is a, a local historical society director uh, who's retired but comes to speak at schools every once in a while. And he spoke to a classroom of about 30 students, but look at the joy in the faces of these young girls who went up to ask him questions. This is enrichment pedagogy, and this is what our field is so well known for. It's making sure that students are exposed, again, to wonderful places, people, ideas. Now, there's so many opportunities to expose them to brief clips online, to documentaries, to poetry. Um, and when you think about the kinds of exposure you can do, and again, having it be vetted, um, I once facilitated an enrichment cluster on poetry, and I, I think my students, the students that took that cluster that, that I facilitated, you know, were exposed to 30 or 40 of the most famous poets who ever lived. We can expose students to old photographs. Um, in Renzulli Learning, we actually have many Library of Congress links with just outstanding historical opportunities. So this is a great way of providing pedagogy to all students. The second type of enrichment, as Joe mentioned, process training, and this is where so much of the critical thinking that comes in. And this has been adapted over time. There's actually six clusters of pedagogy. Oh, so um, cognitive, creative, and critical thinking skills learning how to learn skills, character development, affective, interpersonal, intrapersonal skills, knowing your strengths, knowing your interests, understanding how to use advanced resources, metacognitive technology skills right now, and then also just the idea of how do I provide things to an audience, written, oral, and, physical, uh, and, and visual communication skills. So much of what gifted ed pedagogy, strength-based pedagogy enables us to do, again, we have tried to identify and embed within our model and within Renzulli Learning. Um, so if you think a little bit about critical thinking or online activities, I think this is just such a wonderful example. Um, I was reading my nieces, my niece is graduating, well, she would have been graduating from UConn, she's virtually graduating from the University of Connecticut as a senior, and she it was writing her last paper, and she asked me to read it last night before she handed it in at midnight, and her paper was about fake websites, and all of the fake websites and all of the ways that Twitter uh, has promoted fake websites today, and made me think of this slide, uh, which really is a, a fake website set up by researchers about a tree octopus. Now, if you say tree octopus just for a second, we would realize that this cannot exist. Octop octopi cannot live on trees. But yet, in several different research studies done by research teams, um, what we found is that, you know, 98 to 99 percent of students fell for this. They actually wanted to do fundraising for tree <laughs> octopi. octopi. And, and so there's probably never been a time where we need good type two training skills more than we do now. And then of, la of course, the last part of the enrichment triad model, the best pedagogy for enrichment teaching and learning is projects. When we do longitudinal studies with students that have been in school-wide enrichment model programs, they tell us over and over again about the type threes they did, the projects they did, the trips that they took, the opportunities they had to do things that were memorable uh, to the type ones that they went on. And so many projects um, have been built into Renzulli Learning, but also so many projects um, have been done by students under the tutelage and guidance of a teacher. And, and so right now, when we think about contests and competitions and how-to books, and all of the ways that we can guide students in strength-based pedagogy, think about creating interest centers that can now be done online. I mean, when I think about what I used to do to create paper interest centers at the back of my classroom, 
and now realize that, and, and by the way, if we were in school, I would still advocate that we would do some of this, but right now there's so much that we can provide that's again, already vetted, that makes things, the kinds of things that we want to do, that we can send to students, that we can have them watch, that we can have them participate in, that results in this, this kind of a face, this kind of a joy of learning. And so uh, another important gifted education pedagogy strategy is supporting the struggle. And I don't think there's a better way to introduce that than to talk a little bit about uh, Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. If we let bright students choose the first project or the first type three they wanted to do um, and, and just told them to do it, they would be writing a lot of reports. Instead, what we advocate in enrichment pedagogy is supporting the struggle, have students realizing what it takes to go to the next level. And that can be done mainly with a teacher and a student and, and also parents. So if you're parents of students, we know this is hard and particularly with bright kids who want to get away with their very first attempt at something. But what we want students to learn is to be able to have supported struggles. So by saying, how could you do that differently? How could we use different resources? Maybe this is a better idea for your project. You know, the ladybug game didn't appear that way at the first draft and neither did the button factory. You know, all of these take time and effort, which can be supported by teachers that want to facilitate interest. And that's what strength-based pedagogy really is. So when we think uh, in gifted education about strength-based pedagogy, particularly lose, use, losing, using our approach, and by the way, this is a young Mexican girl who developed a solar water heater, um, and she did not patent this. She gave the instructions away because many people in her small, poor village in Mexico had never had a hot bath. So she developed a, a, a way to make a solar water heater so people could have hot baths uh, in Mexico. And it's, it's been so exciting for us to see the results of this type of gifted education pedagogy spread across the globe. So what, what is some of this pedagogy? It's, it's ways to differentiate, it's ways to compact the curriculum, to teach the curriculum in an ex expedient but thorough fashion so that students who already know it or can learn it in a fraction of the time have an opportunity to do that. It's, it's, it's virtual field trips, it's creativity training, it's problem solving, like with future problem solving. It's giving kids early stage projects, what we call type two and a halfs, and hoping that those will gear up into type threes. And it's giving students time to pursue their interests. All of these things are of critical importance to us. It's providing enrichment clusters. Um, these are done in schools that are using SEM for all students. Um, oftentimes, they're done on a Friday afternoon. This is when students come together with teachers, um, oftentimes across two or three grade levels. Teachers facilitate a cluster that they want to do. Students participate in clusters that they choose. Um, this is one from Bridges Academy in, in Los Angeles, California, which is a school for twice exceptional students and uh, students who are both at a very, very much advanced, but also have significant learning disabilities. And they have clusters every Friday afternoon all year long. And this is one called Culinary Critics. But one of Joe's and my favorite things in the spring is to be able to, in the fall, is to be able to visit schools that are doing clusters and see the thousands of different ideas that teachers have for enrichment clusters. Here's one on Save Our Planet, and here, here's one on Crime Scene Investigation, and here's one that was done in a California school on water watchers during drought time. And as you can tell, if you can see the flowers over my back, I'm a gardener, here's one that I might do on horticulture. And again, the way that a lot of bright students have time to do this is with curriculum compacting, having an opportunity to be able to prove that they can do the work in a fraction of the time and then to change it. And again, we believe strongly that enrichment pedagogy enables teachers to serve as resident escalators. This is where the Vygotsky supported challenge come in, supported struggle comes in. Teachers, as Joe said, 
serving on a gu as guides on the side and supporting uh, talent development activities across all different interests. So when we think again about what's a strength-based talent development approach, it's using strengths and interests to facilitate the kinds of enrichment pedagogy that our field's known for, all the way from Sandy Kaplan's work to depth and complexity to our work in strength-based instruction and embedding critical creative thinking and problem solving, creative productivity, so students grow up to be inventors and writers and musicians. This is not that difficult. It isn't that hard. Uh, in fact, you know, I think many of us want to do this with our own children. We want to embrace their, their need for challenge. We want to provide their social and emotional um, development and make them happy to be in school. So many resources are at your fingertips tonight. Rinzuli Learning free until August. We hope many of you will try that at home with your own students um, that you're working with, with your classrooms, with your schools. Joe mentioned our gifted, www.gifted.ucon.edu. Um, our school-wide enrichment model, there are free resources. There's an entire folder on it. Um, and I think, you know, what I, I just like to kind of conclude with, and, and before we go into questions, is, is this slide. Um, Joe and I were so blessed last year. We've been married um, almost 40 years, and this is our first grandchild uh, from the two of us. We have two other grandchildren that came from Joe's first son that we love dearly. And this is our beloved Abby, who was born uh, in September of, of 19, so she's now uh, 19 months old. And we got a very early clue to Abby's interest when her music teacher walked into the nursery school she was attending last year. She was about eight or nine months old when this photograph was taken, just started to sit up. And look at the joy on Abby's face when the music teacher walked in. Look at that face. Now, um, because we're actually quarantined with our daughter and son and, and, our, and our granddaughter, I do a daily time with Abby for music enrichment. I know my friend Ben is listening and he'll be happy to hear that. But this was taken a few weeks ago when I walked in to do my music time with Abby. It's not so hard to figure out what this 19-month-old loves. She loves music. Music is going to be an enormous part of her life. And so when we think about enrichment pedagogy, you know, what can you do? You can build opportunities for enjoyment and exposure every day. You can create your students' interests. You can ask yourself, how can I make this more enjoyable? Um, you can make academic memories that last. Uh, the young boy that did the button factory, the little girl that did, um, did the project on ladybugs and turned it into a game. We want students, and this is our friend Del Sigley said, said this all the time, we want students to learn something new every day. I try to expose Abby to a new song every day, and sometimes she sings it and hums it throughout the day. We want to develop and encourage students' strengths and interests. Um, my husband's generally fairly modest, so I'm going to end up with this quote of his. I view our work in talent development and education as a war against educational mediocrity, conformity, and the societal institutions that unknowingly or unknowingly contribute to the suppression of creativity. Many battles must be fought before we achieve the equity that talented and creative students need and deserve. Schools should be places for talent development and all students should have the right and the time to develop their talents. We believe through enrichment pedagogy that we can create giftedness by providing opportunities, resources, and encouragement, always in areas of student interest. That is why Joe and I put so much of our work free on our website. It's why we try to give away uh, ideas and videos and PowerPoints. And that's why we're so thrilled that we can now uh, offer you Renzulu Learning for free. It's also uh, an opportunity for us to think a little bit about the development of interest because if you were to ask me to summarize my 40 years and Joe's 50 years, we would tell you in, our, in this field that interests matter most. So find something that's going to be able to develop your students' interests. Give those students a chance to learn to something joyful and new every day. Think a little bit about ways to do this that are exciting and enriching by providing some of your own opportunities or looking at some of the ones that we can help you identify. And again, we'd like to thank you so much. We were so honored 
with the turnout tonight. We are so, so pleased to know that so many of you um, are, are interested. We'd like to thank CAG. And now I'm gonna turn this back over to Julia who talk, will talk a little bit about what CAG has to offer and help us moderate a few questions and answers. Thank you both so much. We also want to share with you another opportunity that you have to see Dr. Renzulli and Dr. Reese speak. We have our Summer Institute, which is virtual this year. So you have worldwide access from July 29th through the 31st from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. You can see not only Dr. Reese and Dr. Renzulli, but also Dr. Sandra Kaplan, Dr. Frank Worrell, Dr. Annabelle Jensen, Dr. Eugenia Mora Flores, and more. So please don't hesitate to register at bit.ly uh, backslash CAG Access Summer Institute. And we're going to go ahead and jump into our questions that we're streaming in in the Q&A pod. If you do have a question, don't hesitate to ask. Just type on the Q&A pod at the bottom of your screen. One of the first questions um, that I'm going to ask you both to answer is, how do we best serve outliers, those on the outer edge of the bell curve in public school? So um, I think, you know, we've been asked many times, does school-wide enrichment do a really good job for students that are extraordinarily bright? And the answer is, you know, over the 40 years we've been working on this model, we've had many students that are in the top one percentile, um, many students that have gone on to medical school, to PhD, and, and of course the answer is, it depends on how many services you can provide. Our very brightest students need not only acceleration via compacting, uh, opportunities for type three enrichment, but they need advanced content. And that is why we, we love to see our work combined with the work of people like Sandy Kaplan that also talk about depth and complexity. But yes, so on that end of the spectrum, yes. And I will also say for students with disabilities, there are many, many places that use SEM as a theme for students that have disabilities. So we've seen it, seen it used with students on both sides. Yeah, uh, teacher, <clears throat> a young person that I talked to that was having great difficulty in school, one of the young people that we worked in, on in the study under achievement with uh, Sue Baum and Tom Eggbear said, they find out what I can't do, won't do, and don't like to do, and spend the rest of the year beating them to death with it. Sally's mentioned, and I think I've mentioned, that if I can find an interest in some child, and not every child has an interest, that's why we have type one, expose them to things that they might get interested, if I can find an interest in a child, just as Sally mentioned a minute ago with our darling granddaughter, Abby, then we can do more with that child to get, to get them uh, more engaged and more in, enjoy learning more. Remember the three E's. And so throw the regular curriculum aside if you have to. Find that interest, concentrate on that. And what we found in our study of underachievers was that not only did they do some remarkable work in their type threes, a number of award-winning projects, I might add, but also their general education achievement started to go up because they realized that there is a value in knowledge acquisition. So that's the best way we can answer that one. Jill, you wanna try another question? Yes, there was also somebody who asked a question in the chat box regarding what you feel the most important issue is for early childhood. Would your answer be the same or how would it differ? I think that Sally might want to comment on this. She's had some more experience with young children than I have. But I think that even the examples that we presented today that cut across an age range, if I were to spend time sharing with you my case studies files, you would find kids across all ages, including college and university students. Sally started a remarkable program at the University of Connecticut for this type of pedagogy with any student that was interested in being involved in this, in this approach to learning. But I do think that um, interests are the keystone and then finding, again, the opportunities and resources to do something with that interest, not just to learn stuff, but to do something. Uh, 
Our daughter Liza is almost a, a perfect example. She's well versed in many, many things that relate to theater, to production, uh, and she now has translated that into all different kinds of jobs. She's an editor, she's a producer, she has her own uh, website. And so I think that finding those things and giving them some purpose, that's where the audience parts come, come in. And we're not gonna solve every problem for every child in the world. But for outliers, I think that this is probably more important than anything that we might do for regular achieving children. And I think the early childhood question is an excellent one. Um, I would say also, in addition to what Joe said and what we've talked about, the embracing challenge. A lot of very young, bright students learn that they need minimum effort to excel. And so what we really want to do is make sure that we teach them how to deal with challenge. Um, if everything's too easy for these kids all along the way, they'll grow up thinking being smart means they don't have to work very hard. And then the first time they really have to work, they simply fall apart. So um, embracing challenge with this supported struggle, doing projects with them, getting them to stay with things that are difficult and not leave them right away, that takes time, it takes patience. And that's what a lot of enrichment pedagogy can help us achieve as well. Another question regarding, uh, what do you do with an underserved population? There's so much raw talent in this population. The question is how to bypass the administration and get teachers in this position to get support and show society that talent and giftedness is found everywhere and anywhere. Would you like to expand on that statement and what strategies you would offer teachers to well, I, I think that, that this is probably the biggest problem facing the field of gifted education today. No week passes by that there's not another newspaper article about the fact that uh, low-income minority dual language students are not being given the kinds of opportunities that they should. I think that there are a couple of things that we've done. Uh, one of them is we established a, a school in Hartford called the Renzulli Academy. I didn't name it, the superintendent did, um, where they use the entire city as the catchment area for these high potential students. And we used uh, only a couple of things to uh, identify them. They were the highest in their grade levels uh, in uh, achievement test scores or class performance. They would have never been in a, quote, gifted program if they lived across the line in one of the affluent suburbs. And they all came together, to come together. We're now in about our 10th year, would you say? Uh, at one school in Hartford. And remarkable things are happy, happening there. And remember my quote, uh, example is the best school of mankind. Try to find a place that you know about that's doing some good things and go and visit. Talk to the teachers, the administrators, the kids, the different kinds of things that they have done. A lot of people today are talking about uh, universal screening. They're talking about local norms, all things that I strongly believe in. But what I believe in most is the pedagogy that we're offering to these children. If we use those things and then basically teach them in the same way, sit, get, and spit, um, it, uh, the way typical schools are run for those kids, they're, they're deluged by worksheets, and um, there's no fun in learning. So let's put some fun in the game. The first of the three E's, in fact, the most exciting instrument that I'm working on right now is a school happiness scale. We've, happy kids learn better. And so we want to ask kids, what makes you happy? Uh, and I do think that these are some of the kinds of things that we need to do. What we've been done, what's been done is we've been sold a bill of goods for low income kids, minority kids on high pressure remediation. And what it's done is it's turned them off to school. And rather than saying school is a fun place to go, some of the kinds of examples you saw, we do on a routine basis at, pl at places like Renzulli Academy. Also, we have some other uh, 
school. And, and if you live in a big district like Los Angeles, for example, you could have a half a dozen of these or a dozen of them in various districts throughout the, throughout the city so that they can come together where this pedagogy is on the front burner. I think that that's one of the things we've done. Trying to change every school in a city of Los Angeles may be impossible, but at least you can get some good things going. And I can't tell you how many visitors from all over the world we've had to Renzulli Academies and a number of other academies using the same approach have developed in many places around the country and the world. There's 40 Renzulli Academies in Turkey. Yeah, I guess I would also just add that um, to do something that would require potentially, you know, a little less time because it might take a while to get the academies up and running, um, that trying to get parents to ask for services is probably the best way to get started. And also to get parents to potentially um, get uh, enrichment clusters going. So if teachers can't make it happen, influential parents with bright kids or creative kids can ask if um, at least a series of enrichment clusters could start. Because again, once people get the, 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 the flavor of this pedagogy, um, great things start to happen. So that would be my suggestion. One other thing that you might want to take a look at, and if you can't find this at our website, drop me an email and I'll send it to you. Uh, I developed with one of my colleagues, uh, Nicole Wykunis, an article which is called Curricular Enrichment Infusion. We have been sold a bill of goods by the standardista, the people that write curriculum standards. And so much of education is guided by that. The other unindicted co-conspirators are the textbook companies and worksheet companies and the test companies. And so what we've tried to do is say, look, we know you've got this albatross hanging around your neck, but the process of infusion says, we're gonna take a topic, the US Civil War. What are you doing that? Well, you memorize the names, dates, generals, and battles. And look for kids' interests in that area using an interest elizer or a series of questions. And then there might be some kids, well, this is an actual example, that were interested in fashion during that time because they, they use as a type one a clip of uh, Gone with the Wind and the hoop skirts and all that. A lot of kids became interested in that. Others were, became interested in photography. Matthew Brady was the first war photographer. And so they got to do some projects related to photography and studied photography of wars and uh, those kinds of things. Uh, some other kids were interested in the music of the Civil War, songs of the North and songs of the South. And so I do think that we're not going to change this standards-driven curriculum. There's too much pressure on that from the highest level policymakers. Um, but what we can do is teach teachers how to pick any topic. Give me any topic you would like, and I have a process where we ask teachers to divide up into subgroups and they brainstorm what's something I could do to make this topic more interesting or more fun. And those two things usually go together. And I think that uh, that's something that we could do for what's going on in so many schools that are just worksheet memorization faculties. Uh, RAM remember and regurgitate because we want to get the scores up on our tests. I think a lot of folks were asking questions about standardized testing. So you definitely, um, you know, started to address that. And I think that's a really important piece that a lot of teachers have on their mind, just judging by the number of questions that we're receiving. I also have a, a number of repeated questions, if you have time for one more, uh, mm -hmm. on how to get buy-in for the school-wide enrichment model. How would you suggest that teachers um, not only get support from their colleagues, but also administration and parents for the school-wide enrichment model? You know, I think that, um, that uh, we've got a volume of research on this that's been around for a long time. 
I think we ask ourselves some fairly simple questions. Do you want students to do better in school? Do you want them to enjoy learning more? Do you want to increase the reservoir of highly creative and productive people? And then I think really it comes down to what, what are the goals? Why are we here? Um, if we're here to try to develop students' creativity and their, and their in, in innovation and inventiveness and again, to, to give them opportunities for higher level challenge, then this is an approach for, for you. You know, we, um, we believe very, very much in this approach. It doesn't have to be something that everybody uses, but if there generally are enough teachers that are involved in wanting to try something, I also really believe that there's a way of starting this with either enrichment, as Joe said, infusion or enrichment clusters. So try a part of it and then add on over the years so you can implement more. But I think buy-in comes when you see joyful learning happen. And that's what SEM is all about, joyful learning and pedagogy that is based on students' interests. And as we've talked about, strengths. Shouldn't we be doing things in schools that develop students' interests, talents, and strengths. And if, if there's an interest in that, then I think there's a way to start with the school enrichment model. I'll let Joe comment as well. I think that one of the things that we have to do is to get through to administrators and policymakers. And when I say policymakers, I, I mean certainly people at state departments of education and uh, school boards. But I think that the only way to do this is to give them some very short, they're not gonna read our school-wide enrichment model book is that thick. They're not gonna read the articles. In fact, I have a folder on my computer, which I call the hook, and it's all short stuff. It's 1,200 word articles that I've had in district administration or uh, education week. And when anybody says, I can't get my principal to even think about this, I send them information about from that file on the hook. Uh, and um, one of the things that Sally and I did, in fact, within the last year, uh, is we prepared a series of seven short videos. I think they're, none of them are longer than 12, 14 minutes. And it, an overview of the model, then the various components that you heard us talk about at this presentation. And one of the things I do is tell people, you can get those, by the way, at our Renzulli, website. And Renzulli Learning. Learning also has a set of them. And the idea is we've got to get somebody that's in a decision-making position, the principal of a school who has a couple of teachers that are listening to this and say, wow, we'd like to try that. The first thing you have to do is to get them to buy in because what's the gun at their head? achievement test scores. And by the way, our research has shown that the three E's actually improve achievement. And there's a wonderful study done at the University of Georgia by a person named Gara Field on the Renzulli learning system that shows that not only the, the, the E's went up, general achievement scores went up as well. But I do think that getting nice, tight, hard hitting information in a very small package, so to speak. Uh, and uh, when somebody contacts me from a district or they want to try to exert some influence in their district, I go right to the hook file and I send them short things, the access to the, the videos or, or YouTubes. Anybody can get them. They're on our website. But you've got to get somebody that is a decision maker to start to have a sense that this can improve their schools. Um, the, uh, that's even the way that we got Renzulli Academy started. We had a couple of superintendents that said, you know, I want to do more for these all urban inner city schools, mostly in Connecticut. We have five major urban districts that are mostly minority students. And we got to the superintendents and, um, I'd like to believe that bottom up is a way to make change, but it's not. It's bottom-up people, teachers in the trenches, that are exerting some influence to get uh, principals, assistant superintendents, superintendents to at least take a look at another brand of learning. 
You mentioned Renzulli Academy. How does one become a Renzulli Academy? I know that districts like Houston, and you, you, know, you have several million uh, students around the world who are part of Renzulli Learning, but how does one become a Renzulli Academy? Well, the academies are, are schools where all of the SEM pedagogy is implemented. So, um, and they oftentimes in some of the larger districts, they are populated by high potential students that apply to go into it. it it's, a, it's another option for a school choice within. So there's school-wide enrichment is used as a magnet theme, uh, is used as a school-based theme, is used as a gifted program. And there are many, the charter schools that use school-wide enrichment, magnet schools. So it's a theme school that in, in some districts is attended by students that are in, would qualify as part of the above average circle of the three ring conception. So that's generally how they're started. And remember my favorite quote, example is the best school of mankind. As soon as someone is interested, besides sending them information about the hook, a superintendent or assistant superintendent, they want to see it in action. I can't tell you how many visitors from around the country and around the world for that matter, have visited our Renzulli Academy in Hartford and uh, also a series of schools in another urban area in Connecticut uh, that is, uh, has a lot of schools that if they don't call themselves Renzulli Academies, they're basically doing what's done at the, uh, the, the ones that use that title. And so, and by the way, the people at, at these academies, they are joyous about having visitors. They are so proud of what they're doing. And a lot of them now, uh, for example, the ones that I just mentioned in Norwalk, Connecticut, the director of that and the teachers are on the road at speaking at conferences. And they spoke at CAG last year. And I think that also, this is where that pride comes out in the profession. We're at the bottom end of the feeding chain of the education profession, that is teachers are. And once they realize that they can exert change on other places, it is with great pride that they go out and do workshops and training sessions on, on what they're doing. And I think that we just need to do more of that. It's not an easy thing. If I come back in another life, I wanna come back in marketing because it's really a marketing approach but you've got to reach people that are decision makers. We'd like to say um, thank you to all the teachers that have joined us. It's Teacher Appreciation Week, and Joe and I um, ha have endless admiration for people who are teaching, and we'd just like to say thank you to everyone, and thank you for joining this webinar tonight, and thanks to CAG and to Renzoli Learning for hosting it. And for the odd hours that many of you around the world are, are sitting up at. Uh, we really appreciate it, and uh, we're happy to have had this wonderful opportunity. We can't quit without telling how much we appreciate Julia's organization and planning mm -hmm. to carry this out. Stay well and stay healthy, everyone. Thank you both so much. Have a great evening, and we really appreciated this presentation. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye.